So thanks for coming out on this uh, rainy night. It was kind of interesting to get over here, but uh, I'm glad you all made it. Um, following Jonathan is, a, is quite, a, quite an experience. I, uh, I, I don't quite have all those credentials, but I've got one, and that is I, I got a little more age. And uh, that, puts me, uh, that puts me a little more knowledgeable about the history of microelectronics, so I'll just tell you a little bit about where that goes and why I got into this medical electronic devices. I started my career at Hewlett Packard in 1974. Uh, I, just uh, threw my stuff in the, in the car when I graduated from Purdue and said, uh, I'll see what happens. So I really uh, fell into this uh, silicon integrated circuit devices uh, without really knowing where I was going. So that was a pretty neat experience. My, six micron technology, 4K DRAMs is what I worked on. So uh, that's quite a ways back, but it was a way to learn really right from the beginning. Um, and it was pretty neat to see at HP how we saw microelectronics change the way people thought about watches and calculators and kind of completely change that industry. And then the rest, everybody, uh, the rest of the story, everybody knows pretty well about the how com computation was changed and kind of changed the way we saw companies out here on 128 to the point of having PCs and so on. And then the world keeps on going. Uh, you got communication technology changing. Uh, I participated some in some consumer electronics with digital cameras. And uh, as Jonathan said, people didn't trust digital cameras, but he also said something interesting. Microelectronics almost always comes in from the bottom and works its way up and gets better and better and then just lets a tiny bit at the top that it may not make, so it covers a huge fraction of the market in many of these different places. So I liked applications and decided to start to think about what's the next application. You know, people ask you what's next and we're supposed to know what's next. Our students think we know what's next. We keep fooling with that. But medical stuff had always interested me from even when I was back at Purdue. I wanted to get into medical electronics, which had been around that long. And some of the companies, the older ones like Medtronics and Boston Scientific are 50-year-old companies. So it's been around, but I thought, well, wow, microelectronics has a really good chance of just making huge changes in this area. And, and I was taking it much from a device point of view, and that's what got me interested in it. Um, so that created this uh, Medical Electronic Device Realization Center. Uh, what we do is really took advantage of microelectronics, bringing together the medical devices and the microelectronics and created the MedRC. But what we've seen more recently is it's just not interesting devices that you've got to work on. It's also how do you extract the information out of these signals and then how do you do things with tons of information that you end up with, with the kinds of devices you can build. And when you build something where it's you're measuring something continuously that you used to just get to measure once. Uh, continuous measurements every second across a person for many days sort of looks longitudinally like big data. And in fact, there's a lot of new things you can learn about the person. There's new things you can learn about the medicine. And hopefully there's lives to be saved and hospital visits to be shortened and so on. So that's the whole hope. Uh, of the MedRC. The second thing was uh, I did my PhD at Berkeley and worked in, uh, in Silicon Valley and so you don't know, know a lot of people on the West Coast and when you come out to Boston they kind of say, wow, you're really going back to, you know, sort of freeze in the dark and I say, well, we've got one area that I think is really uh, Boston's uh, uh, is, is set up for and that is this type of medical electronics for devices that have clinical use with the set of hospitals we have and the several universities we have, including uh, Harvard and MIT, but many others. And also the kind of population that's here in Boston, which is sort of a little more stable and a little more sort of push hard. And I think that these, uh, this is uh, the place where this area, uh, this area can flourish. Okay, so a little bit about the model of how we do things in the MedRC. Uh, a couple of things are different than you normally think. We, try, we spend a lot of time defining the problem, and we bring together clinicians, academics, and industry. And all three of them have their own motivations. The academics, uh, we'll talk about them in a moment. The, the industry is pretty straightforward. They want to make some money, but they also need to have certain amount of volume if they were involving microelectronics. 
The clinicians are the most interesting. They know exactly what they want. It is absolutely useful, and you'll make five of them. Okay, so you'll make it for that person. This person wants something different. This person wants something different. Well, the academics, they also have their own craziness. The academics, they have a particular technology. As long as you use their technology, you'll save the world. Doesn't matter if it's useful or not. So how do you deal with these three entities and try to sort of focus on a problem? And so one of the things we do is spend a fair chunk of time, six months or so at the beginning of the project, to just go through this definition part. So that's one thing that's different. A second thing is to have somebody at MIT from the company. And the thinking simply there is, we're no, we know we're not smart enough to get exactly the right problem. But maybe along the way, some of the things that we'll work on will actually be useful to that company. And they can pull things, and they know everything that's back behind them in their, in their company at home. So they can pull particular technologies back to the company. The third thing we do is also, for those of you that are IC designers or went to school in IC design, the typical thing you do is you figure out a problem you're working on. You design this chip, and you measure it. And it's kind of boring because you know, can't see anything but a few scope traces. So you build some, some demo around it. You know, and that's really hard, and it's right at the end of your PhD. You really don't want to spend any time on it. So it sort of works. You stand on your head, and you, know, you get something to come out, and everybody says, yeah, that's great. OK, so I figured out this is backwards. You know, if we really want to learn about things in this space, I've got to get people in the clinic first. So when I have a student early on, we say, build something up, whatever we're going to work on, whatever device is with off-the-shelf parts. It might be kludgy. It might be big. But it has to be absolutely bulletproof, because we're going to bring it into a clinic and do some measurements. So you can't wheel in the power supplies and stand on your head and make it work. It has to be self-contained. So that in itself is a learning process. And going in the clinic is a real learning process for students. And it was a learning process for me. You, know, you figure you know exactly how it should work, but each person is a lot different than you ever thought. And so it's, it's a little like in, back in the old days when we were building silicon. You said, you forget the models, you know, because they never work. The you only, you only thing you will believe is true silicon. Now the models are very good, so you can actually trust them. But measuring people is a real experience and not as uh, obvious as you may think. So the last slide about the MetRC is how do you choose application areas? Where's microelectronics going to have an impact first? Um, and I, I chose things that you know, that's, were sort of obvious at the time, but to look at monitoring. And we separated it into being wearable monitors and minimally invasive monitors. And it took a while to decide which one you should do. You'd say, well, why don't you just make everything wearable? The problem is if you, need a pro if you have a problem where you have to measure somebody 24-7, then you absolutely will not have a wearable. They will take it off, they'll put it down, and they will not put it on right after they're done with whatever they're doing. So having something that's minimally invasive, whether it's just slightly inside the skin or other ways, and I'll show you an example of one, is what you have to do in monitoring 24-7. Other things where you just want to monitor a lot more than you're used to, like an ECG or, or a mean arterial blood pressure, something like that, where usually you just get it once a year. How about if you get it once a minute? Or eh, maybe the thing doesn't always work because you're work at walking around and so on. But some of the devices, you have to be still. And I look at you in the audience, and everybody would be measuring things just perfectly right now. Hopefully, you're not asleep. But other than that, it would be worth measuring perfectly. So that's the difference between minimally invasive and, and, and wearable devices. Joel Voldman, who's uh, on the faculty at MIT, does a lot of this lab on the chip stuff. And we really tried to expand that to build uh, lab instruments that can come from, the cl uh, from, the, from a, a, either the hospital or uh, something like Quest and bring them into the home so people don't have to go out and get their blood tests. But actually, you can make it cheap enough. Uh, and the real trick there is to go away from optics and use electronics. The fourth area we picked was imaging. And we said, I was sort of naive. I thought, oh, we'll just do imaging of all kind. You know, I built cameras, so I was pretty used to that. But I forgot about the fact that in a lot of the kinds of things in radiology, no matter what you do with microelectronics, it's very hard to make it cheap, and it's very hard to make it small. And the problem is, not, is, is really in the source. If it's MRI, a superconducting magnet, if it's a CAT scan, these, these big x-ray generators. So 
it's, it's sort of, it's not fundamental. You can build a smaller source, but it's really hard to build a good so quality source, and that's where all the work is, and microelectronics doesn't necessarily help you there. Ultrasound was a very different animal because ultrasound, you actually could use microelectronics array and planar technology uh, uh, to, to build both a transmitter and a receiver, if you will, or the ultrasound generation of ultrasound and the receiving in arrays. And uh, you know, that, was, that was pioneered by, uh, by, by people at Stanford, Pierre, uh, uh, pioneered that kind of technology. And from that allows you to make really inexpensive or less expensive types of ultrasound. And we use those in a kind of a couple interesting ways, and I'll show you a few of those. And then finally, some data communication of having body area networks, or how do you connect various sensors that you want to connect together. So let me talk to you about one of the more successful projects. It was one of the first ones we had by David He and Eric Winokur. And we talked to physicians and wanted to measure vital signs and came up with this idea. He was very adamant about do your measurements at the ear. And um, he said, number one, you know, it's a good anchor and so on. He said, but there's a, there's a, there's a myriad of good uh, uh, things that you can measure at the ear to understand vital signs. Well, we weren't really sure what he was talking about, but we, we listened to him. And the next thing we did was we said, okay, well, we, can we measure ECG at the ear? And, and, and you can. It's not nearly as strong a signal as at the heart. It's about two, three, two orders of magnitude lower, but you can do it. And you can measure PPG, that uh, pla uh, photoplasmogram that you see when you put something on your finger and measure the optical signal to get your, uh, your uh, oxygen saturation in the blood. And you can measure that up here also. You measure the pulsatile going through. It's now reflectance. The, uh, the optics is going in and reflecting off the bone rather than transmissive through your fingers. So a little different kind of technology, but not too hard to do. And while we were measuring this ECG signal at the ear, we noticed that we saw one of these pulses that was kind of strange. It didn't really look right. And it was also delayed from the actual ECG signal when we measured it at the heart. And that took David, he, and Eric a little while to figure out. But we found that what we were measuring was a ballistiocardiogram. And it turns out what that is is when, the, when your left ventricle fills up and your builds up pressure and then your aortic valve opens up, there's a rush of blood that's a high acceleration and you have a re reaction force. And so for each one of you, if you put a bicycle helmet on your head and a kind of a reasonably good uh, accelerometer, you'll see that your head is moving up and down with each heartbeat at the time when the aortic valve opens up and the rush of blood comes out. So we have these three signals we can measure. You measure an electronic signal, a mechanical signal, if you will, an optical signal. And we put those together, and the way we did was we fire at the ECG, you fire your heart, that's the start of the pumping time. It's a timing signal. Now the blood fills up the left ventricle, and then it opens up the aortic valve. That's the pre-ejection time, the time between the ECG signal and the BCG signal. And then the blood transits up its way up to one ear or the other, whichever one it's on here, and you see that pulsatile come through with the optical signal, so you have a transit time. And that transit time basically is related to the mean arterial blood pressure. So we can measure things like the pre-ejection period. With the amplitude of this BCG signal, we can measure cardiac output. And if we combine this BCG and PPG signal, we can get a handle on an estimate of the uh, mean arterial blood pressure. So back to the students, I have them, after they sort of got this all figured out, I said, well, how are we going to make it cheap? So we built some chips, and uh, one built a, instead of doing the whole ECG, since we just need a timing signal, built a chip to just get the heart rate and get that timing signal. So he was able to do that with a research I see that was about 60 nanowatts, so you could make it certainly cheap at extremely low power. And then Eric, in terms of this PPG, figured out how to build a, all, the, all the front end circuitry that was needed and to reduce that power down to about a microwatt for measuring this. So each of them then had this chip design experience. But I don't make them go that next step, okay, now put it all together and put it in here because that's, that's sort of the end of the road. So we just inverted the way students went through the IC process. Okay, now let me whip through a couple different projects. 
Um, this one is at the start, and uh, Maggie Delano, uh, Delano's making a, a wearable uh, long-term cardiac monitor and uh, with an accelerometer on it. There's nothing fancy about it. It's well put together, nice sort of small piece in packaging. You're just seeing the outside there with the battery. And then these wired uh, electrodes, well, what she did was on those electrodes, they're active electrodes rather than passive electrodes. Well, we have some buffers up here in these electrodes. A simple reason for that is now you have a way to connect electrically from here to the center point with a low impedance. And if you look at this ECG signal, it's really a almost textbook signal with the P wave, Q, R, S, and T wave. And uh, it's quite clean. There's no filtering on this. Okay, so this 60 hertz is around, so there's no filtering on this at all. So that's, a, that's, a, that's just a pretty neat idea. This is, is, it's not that hard. Uh, certainly could be done to reduce the size on this by doing a, a chip and so on. But reason we did it was we wanted our own monitor to be able to put on to people and think about things like using machine learning to look at what Colin Stoltz and his students look at, what's called uh, morphological variability of this ECG signal. So what he does is he takes one ECG signal, put it on top of the other, if you will, and then measure what's the difference between one and the other. And then what's the difference between this one and this one? And of course, you could take the second one and this one. So there's a lots of different combinations you could imagine and come up with this score of morphological variability. Now, at first, what they did was they took the uh, tests from, uh, from some data uh, received from mimic data from people from uh, Beth Israel. They knew what the outcome was. Some had bad outcomes. Some had good outcomes. And basically tried to predict that the risk. And so the, the red hash mark here is the percent of deaths oh, if there's so many days. And the blue hash mark is uh, the, the, the percent of death. But you see there's a big split between here. These were the high risk prediction. These were the low risk prediction. And then they went ahead and worked with some machine learning algorithms. And you see they could split it a little further. Now, the reason we want to do the measurements rather than just take data and just be nice, clean data is when you know the measurements, you actually know what's going on. How is that ECG signal? What are the reasons there could have been morphological variability that was due to the way it was measured? You never know that from a data set. And so that's where the connection between sort of the guys that grab data, which is something that I like to do, and extract it from signal processing and pass it over to somebody that knows how to do this uh, machine learning and go work together. So it's the cross-disciplinary things that Jonathan mentioned to you. Uh, Maggie's also working on uh, sort of an indirect measurement of, for people that have congestive heart failure. Uh, whatever, what, one of the telltale signs is that your legs start to swell and you have fluid buildup. Some of you that may have older parents uh, have s seen that. And the, the typical prescription when you get sent home from the hospital with congestive heart failure is they tell you, you to weigh yourself every day, and if you go up by two pounds, call your doctor. I mean, that's a heck of a way to figure out what's going on with your fluid status. So we look at measuring impedance, and we're looking at measuring impedance at the leg uh, to, 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 to uh, look at that uh, fluid status. This is a project, again, that's just at its very beginning. I told you I'd tell you something about minimally invasive uh, uh, devices. And we work with Sid Cash, who is a neurologist on at MGH. He has his uh, uh, epilepsy patients. And one of the things you'd like to do is count seizures. So if you wear an EEG thing, I mean, that's, again, you'll never be able to wear it all the time. And the amazing thing is that most patients that have epilepsy don't have a very good count of when they have seizures. So he wanted to count seizures, and we've looked at where to put the, the, uh, the, the electrodes is between the skin and the skull. So this is not drilling holes, but simply sliding it up between the skin and the skull, eight electrodes. So this project has been going on for a while because we had an amount of technology that needed to be developed for this, as well as the ICs. We're just about there to the point of the next step is to test this in pigs and uh, actually get the ECG, I'm uh, sorry, the EEG measurements from inside the head. I don't know what happens with these uh, force measuring probes. They seem to be gone, but that's, that's kind of interesting. This is one of those things you don't know. But 
OK, so I'll tell you about it. I'll use it this way because uh, so, so we have an ultrasound probe. Uh, Alice is pretty familiar with these. So we have one that's handheld. And, and here's a linear array of, your, uh, of, of, of the uh, piezoelectric ultrasound uh, uh, transducers. So one of the things that Brian Anthony said he wanted to do was he wanted to build a, a force-controlled one. So basically, first of all, when the person pushes down on this ultrasound, we wonder, well, how hard are they pushing? How hard is this sonographer pushing? And so what you can do is you build a little force feedback system, and you can measure it. And not only can you measure it, but you can decide, I want five newtons I want to put five newtons on it this time. I want to do it one month from now later. So imagine that you're measuring somebody that has a tumor. You have sonographer A. They push this hard. One month later, they push harder. Then the tumor deformation looks different, and it's hard for the radiologist to de determine what the changes are. So that was the first step. The next step was, well, if you can do that, you know, maybe you could start to control this and help the sonographer get to the right place. All this thinking was the same thing. You know, we could reduce, maybe we could reduce this ultrasound probe, and maybe we could reduce this ultrasound to a very cheap price. Well, let's suppose it's free. Okay? If for every measurement you've got to ship a sonographer with it, that's the person that's going to cost the money. So it's, it really doesn't save as much as you might think. It saves a lot, but not as much. So Brian and his students have been working on this to basically make ultrasound easier to deal with. Also, because you have a force feedback system, you can do things like elastography or understand what the elastic properties are of various blood vessels and tissue that you're pushing on. So the last project I'll talk about quickly is uh, the measure of cerebral blood flow velocity. Uh, that's the blood flow here in the mid-cerebral artery, the MCA. And the way that this is done is with a single transducer on the outside here. And it measures the Doppler, uh, the Doppler shift of the blood. So the blood's flowing this way, and you want to have this ultrasound wave come in. And as this blood flows more, there's a Doppler shift from that when, the re when the wave returns back. So there's an off-the-shelf uh, box here from, uh, that people use to measure this. And it's expensive for two reasons. One is they don't sell too many. Two, it's a pretty big box. Three, it's a single transducer. Four, it takes a very skilled sonographer to find the window of which to look for that mid-cerebral artery. And then once you find it, to kind of move it a little bit and try to maintain that you have that. So how do you measure this velocity? Well, you can measure it once. You can measure it for five minutes. But you can't measure it for hours. And this was an interesting problem posed to us that uh, we, we looked at ways to deal with it. And what uh, uh, Sabino actually is here, Sabino Pietrangelo, is working on having an array. OK, so we have now an array. And we don't have any fancy array. We just have a piezoelectric array there. Uh, because what we want to do is, with that array, be able to use sort of radar techniques, if you will. And we'll be able to steer the beam. Okay. So we could steer it this way or steer it this way. In fact, ac actually find that mid-cerebral artery and track it. And so same idea. Go ahead and build this up. Go into the clinic. Let's measure some people, see how well that works. Can we make this work? Can the steering work so well? Uh, we think it can. You keep working on that. And then what you do, the next pace is, OK, now we can go ahead and use some of the array technology. And we can go ahead and put some ICs. And one could conceptually build a wearable ultrasound that could do this detection of the blood, cerebral blood flow velocity in the mid-cerebral artery. So that's a sort of a whirlwind tour of the kinds of things we do. The last one that I had mentioned was Joel Volman's work on, on the, the microfluidic detection of protein biomarkers. Bottom line with this, what Joel said is optics are big, optics are power hungry. They build machines like this. They're fast, but they're expensive. Let's try a different way. Let's do it all with electronics. Let's make sure that we can change the capacitance or change some electronic parameters and measure those changes in parameters. 
uh, to do this detection of biomarkers. And if you notice, I'm skating over this one a little quickly, not because I'm probably over time, but there's only so many things in this world I know something about, and this certainly is not one of them. <laughs> so with that, thanks for your time. Let me acknowledge our, our, our sponsors in the MedRC Analog Devices, uh, G Healthcare, Maxim Integrated Products, Nihon Coden, and uh, lots of other help from uh, people like the Industrial Liaison Program. And most of all, from you guys. I, I hope you enjoyed it, spent a little time here. Sorry for the rain, but hopefully I was a little bit entertaining. Thanks.